Welcome to the latest edition of our AT Carney, the Wave of the Future podcast series. I'm Helen Clegg, and I'm joined today by Rose Kelly Falls, Senior Vice President and Head of Supplier Risk at Rapid Ratings International, a firm that assesses the financial health of its client suppliers. Rose works with supply chain clients to develop, implement, and grow their risk management initiatives. In today's podcast, we're discussing the need for procurement and finance departments to work closely together to mitigate supply chain risk and best practice in accomplishing this. Rose, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you as a speaker today. Now, I'd like to start by asking you how companies have been thinking about risk and responding to it, and why you think it's time for a paradigm shift in this mode of thinking. Thank you, Helen, very much for having me. So I'll address the question, um, just talking about over the last you know, several years, we've encountered risk in the supply chain that frankly have been unimaginable. And the amount of natural disasters we've seen, economic events, political situations, have really opened up our eyes and helped us rethink about how to manage our suppliers and, and our supply chains. So previously, executives might have asked, you know, how likely are we going to experience a supply chain disruption and how much is it going to cost if we do experience such an event? Uh, I think now they've changed their mode of thinking. They're now asking, how quickly can we recover from an event? It's inevitable that probably something is going to happen. And rather than focusing on the bulk of their attention on the risk itself that you know a particular disruption uh, might present, I think senior executives have transformed their thinking and they're now looking broadly at the resilience of their supply chain. In other words, how quickly can they recover? We've realized that we can't fully prevent a supply chain disruption from occurring. Uh, what we can focus on is gaining a better understanding um, of our path to recovery when a crisis does strike. Just, I think, in my last thoughts, you know, a paradigm shift really does need to occur, and we need to have more collaboration among our cross-functional teams. It's taking a lot more people to manage these events, and it really should not fall on just one group. Um, it needs to be a collaborative effort. And really what I'm referring to is the collaborative effort between procurement, finance, legal, manufacturing, quality, and I would say even other key departments who really uh, all need to work together as one cohesive unit. The impact of a disruption itself most likely will be felt across the company. So individuals from a broad range of corporate functions are going to have to be involved in developing strategies to address any kind of disruption that could occur. I know this sounds easy, but in fact, as you can imagine, it is not. And in many situations, these teams don't see eye to eye. And the process of getting um, the buy-in can often be stemmed by a conflict of opinion. So, Rose, you talk about more collaboration being needed among the cross-functional teams. So, let's pick finance and procurement departments. Why has it been, and in some organizations continues to be, difficult for finance and procurement departments to work easily together? Well, unfortunately, you know, many finance and procurement functions disagree over the fundamental elements of supplier risk management. And like other types of tensions between departments, the finance and procurement conflict is often rooted in what I would consider to be a lack of understanding about the value that each team really brings to the table. So let me give you an example. You know, procurement may criticize finance for being too numbers driven in assessing suppliers. Um, they may be criticized for using only financial metrics to benchmark supplier viability. Whereas by contrast, you know, finance often criticizes procurement for not focusing enough on the numbers and for overemphasizing supplier relationships. Now, it's true that placing too much emphasis on relationship history or instincts about a supplier can cause challenges, and decision makers might miss warning signs of potential issues, where on the other hand, factors other than the number crunching of financial figures may provide context that's crucial for really effectively managing risk. Um, we'll use product quality, timeliness of delivery, and other metrics to really illustrate um, how they play a role in supplier decisions alongside cost. Holding suppliers to performance expectations around what I call softer metrics um, helps ensure that the company will be able to deliver products that effectively meet its own customer needs. So when procurement and finance both take firm stances that discount the value of the other group's preferred metrics, their differences can lead not only to misunderstandings, but also to disagreements about how the company should engage in spe with specific suppliers. Suppliers need clarity, and they need clarity around their customers' expectations in order to meet their customers' performance requirements. And I think this type of internal conflict, if it does occur, can create unnecessary confusion with the supplier, and that can lead to customer-supplier misalignment 
and then ultimately a declining relationship. Rose, let's take the finance department. What should finance executives be doing to start to understand the way in which their organization's procurement department works? Well, I'll begin with just what I would consider to be the first step. I think the first step in resolving what I consider these interdepartmental tensions is to build into each function a healthy respect for the other group. And this is where knowledge and understanding can lead to an effective team. Developing you know, a sense of respect may begin when the company's CFO and its CPO cultivate that solid relationship. So again, it's starting from the top and being driven down. The CFO can lay the groundwork for such a relationship by making an effort to understand how effective procurement teams can impact the bottom line and how jointly the two teams together can provide greater results. You know, if you think about just a few decades ago, the procurement team was generally viewed as a back office tactical group with very little influence on decisions that impacted the bottom line. That has changed today. They actually have a seat at the table. And in today's environment, you know, the CPO and his organization are becoming more and more influential. And there was a study done in 2013, which I found interesting, that stated that high performing procurement departments can drive higher profits. That's a pretty powerful finding. So just thinking about this, um, you know, a successful procurement function can build stronger supplier relationships, which ultimately will encourage individual suppliers to cut costs, um, deliver on time, and provide higher quality products. Um, what this means, if the CPO can impact profitability, not only by reducing costs of components to the company's products, but also by providing customer satisfaction through timely delivery. You talk about CPOs and CFOs building a solid relationship. What advice do you have for CPOs who aren't viewed at the same level as their CFOs and feel that their department is undervalued in their organization? How do these CPOs start to build a constructive dialogue with their finance counterparts? Well, for a CPO that feels undervalued, I think the best way is to start having productive dialogue with the CFO. Um, The CPO and his team really need to be able to quantify the impact of the value that they contribute, and they need to be able to demonstrate that to the CFO. Um, They need to do this through metrics and their overall contribution that the team has provided, but also show how improved relationships with suppliers can translate into an improved bottom line. So let me give you an example. So during some very challenging times in the automotive industry, executives at one of the leading automotive manufacturers could not understand why their suppliers were not cooperating with their cost reduction initiatives. So surveys provide a lot of information. So upon surveying their supply base, the results came back and showed that the suppliers had no interest in working on cost reductions. And the suppliers felt that there really was no incentive to do so. So the manufacturer actually made a commitment to modify the culture of how it was going to manage those relationships. And over time, and it did take time, uh, it saw a drastic change in the level of cooperation from its suppliers, who eventually actually wanted to work with the organization after this relationship um, had improved. I think the resulting cost reductions enabled the manufacturer to better compete in the market, um, which boosted the bottom line and benefited initiatives of both the CPO and the CFO. Rose, how do you expand the CPO-CFO relationship to include their respective teams? And what steps should these teams take to develop a risk management initiative? So once procurement and finance executives are seeing eye to eye, it's going to become much easier because they can facilitate their teams as they begin to cascade the importance of the collaboration. And a key area that these teams can work together on is developing and what I would consider essential in any company, which is a joint supplier risk management initiative. Both procurement and finance can equally contribute. Finance can bring to the table a firm grasp of the numbers indicating the supplier's financial contribution to the company, and they can be prepared to demonstrate their analytical talents to the procurement team. Now, procurement should come to the table armed with information about risk that they may encounter um, with their key suppliers. I think when both teams are prepared and they're ready to work closely together, then they can begin to solve those critical issues as a component of a comprehensive risk management initiative. 
Rose, what else do you recommend companies do to enable a joint supplier risk management initiative to emerge? I'm thinking about this from the people perspective. It's important to bring the strategy to life, and in order to do that, a company should ensure that it has the appropriate individuals in place. Talent, I know, has been a challenge, but what's happening now is that many of the Fortune 500 companies are seeking talent and adding a, a position in their organization that actually reports to the C CPO, and this individual's responsibilities are very risk management focused, where they are identifying, assessing, and really mitigating supplier risk. So this individual typically has both what I would consider to be a very strong procurement background, but also a very strong understanding of risk management. And the role ends up being critical you know, to the company's view and to the bottom line uh, of managing supplier risk. The individual often is going to work in tandem with not only their suppliers, but with key stakeholders inside the organization, such as individuals in the finance, legal, and even operations team, to ensure that the company's overall arching risk management objectives are met, but also as the risk management goals of each individual departments are met. That's really interesting, Rose, um, about the new position that companies are, are putting in place to facilitate the Joint Supplier Risk Management Initiative. So, um, talking a little bit about cultural aspects, building a good performance finance, finance relationship is critical. So, from your perspective, uh, what else needs to change? We encourage our clients to have detailed discussions with suppliers about risk and, frankly, about their financial position. And these discussions improve communication, provide better insight into what's happening behind the scenes in the relationship, and can often ease tensions. Um, in order for the discussions to be productive, however, the procurement staff may require some training. And training of this sort is an easy step to overlook because I think that it's assumed that procurement professionals are often well-versed in communicating with suppliers. And part of the training aspect can really help provide knowledge on how to handle uh, financial discussions with suppliers. I think understanding the financial strengths and weaknesses of existing and pr prospective suppliers is crucial um, to meeting the objectives that everyone is involved in. And although most procurement professionals understand what's included in risk assessments, many of them, as I mentioned, are uncomfortable with financial assessments. And the finance function can really help educate procurement and provide a better understanding of suppliers' financial health and how to best employ the tools that the company uses to measure a supplier's financial strength and weakness. And Rose, as we come to the end of this podcast, one last question for you, which is what further steps can companies take to make sure that the procurement and finance relationship continues to blossom? As the evolution of supplier risk management continues to play out, companies' decisions about strategic initiatives related to supply chain risk um, will increasingly require a multi-dimensional view of the impact on the corporate balance sheet. And that makes a strong finance procurement relationship crucial. Uh, the functions have to work together. They have to be able to ensure not only that the company's supply chain is healthy, but also that the organization is on track to meet its own revenue objectives. So finance must think of procurement as a strategic partner in order for the collaboration to have a meaningful impact on the organization's bottom line. I think the functions are always going to clash to some degree, um, simply by virtue of the personality types involved. But like every other relationship, the finance procurement partnership can be improved through frequent and very open communication. And many companies have implemented monthly meetings between the CFO and CPO to discuss opportunities and concerns. I think it's a great way to bridge the gap. And these meetings, like financial training for procurement professionals, uh, should become standard practice. Open communication is going to ensure that these teams are on the same page. Should any issue arrive in the future, then everyone will be ready, already be in agreement on what factors to consider and how to determine the best path forward to ensure minimal impact on their long-term operations. And Helen, I think in closing, building this relationship is worth the investment. And if a company can simultaneously capitalize on finance and procurement strengths, it is definitely going to gain better insight into the risks and opportunities in its supplier relationships, which ultimately can minimize the impact of a disruption. In addition, it can help ensure that suppliers deliver on time, within budget, and contain costs. I'm hopeful for the future, and I feel very confident that the cultural shift 
uh, toward a more prominent and engaged CPO-CFO relationship will leave companies more prepared when the next crisis strikes. Well, thank you, Rose, for your insights. Uh, that was really very interesting. A couple of, of key takeaways from, from my perspective, having listened to you uh, answer my questions, is that firstly, um, procurement professionals really need to get comfortable with financial assessments. Um, secondly, that there is re a real need for both procurement and finance teams or departments to communicate openly and have respect for each other. And thirdly, procurement and finance are absolutely absolutely strategic partners in, in this respect, and uh, I think that will help make them work better together as well. So on that note, Rose, thank you ever so much for sharing your insight and knowledge with us um, and for being my guest today. I'd also like to thank our production engineer, Tom Klein. Thank you for listening to this edition of The Wave of the Future. If you have any comments on this podcast or have a suggestion for a podcast topic, please share your thoughts via Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at AT Carney. This has been an AT Carney podcast production. Join us again soon for our next Wave of the Future podcast. 